All right. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. Hit play. And if you can't hear, let me know. Um, but usually this works, so. I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships for the Education Partners, and I have served on the ILA Board of Directors since 2019. I am excited to introduce you to tonight's presenter, Nell K. Duke. She is a professor in literacy, language, and culture, and also in the combined program in education and psychology at the University of Michigan. Her work focuses on early literacy development, particularly among children living in economic poverty. She has been named one of the most influential education scholars in the United States by Education Week. In 2018, she received ILA's William S. Gray Citation of Merit for her outstanding contributions to literacy research, theory, policy, and practice. There will be time for a Q&A at the end of Nell's presentation. You may submit questions via the questions box or in the chat box. Please know that if the chat box conversations become distracting, you can minimize that area of your screen. If you're tweeting along, please remember to tag ILA at ILA today and use the hashtag ILA webinar. So um, this is not live. This was done, I think, a month and a half ago. So if you are on Twitter, you could probably um, um, pull up that hashtag and see what the conversation was if you're interested. One other thing with Nell Duke is some of you will be reading um, her article for the live action role play. Um, even if you're not reading it, I would highly recommend checking out. It's a really good one on kind of scaffolding um, and supporting reading comprehension. Um, so I'll just add my little um, kind of introduction to her as well. The archived closed caption recording of this webinar will be available within the next 10 days. You will receive an email from ILA following this event once the on-demand recording is available. You will also be able to access that at literacyworldwide.org slash digital events. And now, without further ado, please welcome Nell K. Duke. Thank you so much, Kia, and hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on the science of reading comprehension instruction. My plan for our time together is first for me to just talk about what does the science of reading comprehension or word recognition or whatever instruction mean, and then to talk about some of the false choices and mischaracterizations that I see in the area of comprehension instruction. I'll then present a layered model of effective reading comprehension instruction and talk about nine key understandings about reading comprehension. And as Kia indicated, there will be time um, towards the end of the session to entertain uh, questions. So please do uh, post those as they arise. So the term, the science of reading has actually been around for quite a long time, but it has certainly gained popularity in the last uh, few years. And it's already one of those terms and we have many of them in literacy and in education um, that's somewhat contested. Dif different people have somewhat different definitions or views of what the science of reading means. Um, I'm going to explain briefly how I think about the term, although I could do a whole presentation on just that, but at least briefly, um, I want to explain what, how I think about the term by using a vaccine research as a context um, for talking about um, some distinctions. So if we think about the development of a vaccine, something I know a lot of people on this uh, webinar are probably have been thinking about of late, um, we know that one part of that process is basic research. That's research that typically happens in a lab, um, and it's research that really provides the basic information that's needed to be able to do the next phase of research, uh, which is clinical research. Um, in vaccine development. So this is where they do things like randomly assign um, 
people to either receive the va vaccine or to not receive the vaccine, or they look at the long-term implications of use of vaccine in a particular population and so on. And then finally, there's a third phase, at least, in a vaccine development um, and, and dissemination. And that's the phase where we uh, the attention sort of shifts to um, the implementation of that vaccine, getting it out there and into people's arms. And you see public relations campaigns like the one um, that's depicted on the screen with uh, former presidents and uh, spouses. And that phase of research in medicine is often known as translational research. It's research that really looks at things like uh, equity in, and access to a particular treatment, in this case, a vaccine, um, compliance with that treatment. So for example, if people, if it's a two-dose vaccine cycle, are people getting the second dose or not? Um, people who are resistant to um, receiving the vaccine, um, studying that, also studying um, people who are literally <laughs> resistant in the sense that, that the vaccine uh, doesn't uh, seem to, to protect them individually. Um, there's attention to the regulatory and the public health environment in translational research, sort of how does uh, what's been studied in the lab and moved into a clinical setting, how does that um, sort of expand and disseminate into the world? So if you think about those three, um, you can really make parallels to science of reading. So when we do um, science of reading that looks at reading processes, the kinds of things that we do by studying fMRI um, scans, for example, or when we are uh, looking at lab or just one-on-one -on -one, um, research with um, children or readers to understand you know, the basic processes they're undergoing, that's uh, more like basic research in the vaccine context. Clinical research in a vaccine context has, as, as a parallel, I would argue, um, within the science of reading, um, instructional research on reading instruction or instructional research. Um, so it takes what we've learned in the lab, hopefully, and then begins to uh, see, and, and of course, in the case of reading, it's not only in a lab, but in classrooms and elsewhere, but sort of takes it to scale and does something like randomly assign students to two different approaches to reading comprehension and instruction to see which one is most Thanks. And then, um, thank you much. Yeah, type of research that's uh, parallel to or similar to translational research in the vaccine arena, and that's research um, that is often called implementation uh, science within the education field. Um, it's really uh, looking at scaling, looking at issues of equity and access. For example, if we know a particular practice is effective. Um, is it equitably distributed across the population of classrooms or are some kids likely to um, receive this practice or this intervention and other um, kids not and so on. Um, so you can see that a lot of the same issues that we think about in vaccine research have some kind of parallel within um, the implementation science realm. So when I talk about science of reading, I believe it encompasses all three of these. It is science um, understanding basic reading processes, but it's also scientific research that looks at uh, reading instruction. And it's also scientific research that looks at the um, implementation scale, um, equity issues and other um, matters related to uh, the widespread use of that um, reading instruction. So for me, a science of reading encompasses all of these things, and it probably goes without saying, but for me, the science of reading also encompasses not only word recognition, which is um, how some people seem to understand that term, but it encompasses scientific research across different aspects of the reading process. In today's presentation, most of my um, remarks will focus on the science of reading instruction, um, as the title uh, suggests, but I will say a little bit about some research on basic reading comprehension processes, and I will also make a few references um, to uh, issues that really fall more in the implementation science aside. So as I think you know, this webinar today is based on an article and you'll be getting an advanced copy of this article, which will be out more broadly in May. Um, this is an article that has co-authored, so I want to make sure that I acknowledge my wonderful collaborators in this work, Alessandra Ward of the University of Michigan and P. David Pearson, Emeritus of the University of California at Berkeley. I also want to thank Jan and Robin of the Reading Teacher uh, co-editors for inviting us to write this piece in the first place. I do hope that you will read um, the article that will be shared with you. Um, this webinar is not actually a full replication of the article or its contents. 
For example, in the article, we start off by um, providing a passage from a third grade reading test uh, in California. Uh, not the whole passage, but a pretty good chunk of it. And we ask uh, readers of our article to, to read that piece. And then throughout the article, we uh, link different aspects of comprehension and comprehension instruction back to um, what it would take to comprehend uh, that particular article from a third grade reading test. So um, I really hope you'll read the article so that you can um, experience that technique and see how it works for you. So I alluded to some false choices in reading comprehension instruction. And, and one of those false choices that I encounter out there in the field periodically is the idea that there's some kind of choice between word recognition instruction and comprehension. Like you only do one or- So uh, she's alluding to back in the 80s, early 90s, they, they had this thing called the reading wars, um, people pro phonics, um, and then people were more um, whole language with comprehension. And what happened is people ordered from bottom up process approach and people were uh, arguing for a top down um, process approach. You probably studied bottom up, top down in some of your ed psych classes. And so this is kind of where I'm giving you just a little background on this. And what she's saying is that's not either or um, is what she's gonna start arguing, um, which is kind of what the consensus now is the other or the first few grades of school you do one and then you switch to the other um and that's just i i have looked and looked and i just cannot find research studies that would lead me um to that conclusion and and i'll show you in a in a little bit um a different way of thinking that i think is more consistent with the research another false choice that <laughs> quite a bit um, in recent years is this idea that we're choosing between knowledge building or strategy instruction um, and lots of people arguing, you know, stop doing strategy instruction and do knowledge building instead. And again, I would say this is a false choice. Um, actually, the research suggests that um, effective strategy instruction is very often in the context of knowledge building. And uh, research suggests that there is not actually a competition, but rather a synergy that can exist between strategy instruction and knowledge building. I'll add this, the, a lot of this is off of her research that strategy instruction is built in the epistemology of the discipline. And so strategy instruction and kind of how to read science correlates to how knowledge gets constructed in science or in history or in ELA in humanity. So this is really kind of interesting. Um, so the strategy instruction and this, she is right. It's very synergistic and there is, you shouldn't have to have a choice between the two. Another um, thing I encounter a lot in the field that I think is maybe a mischaracterization is maybe the best way to put it, but it's this idea that you do each of these things in isolation. So you, you have a part of your day or you have a set of practices you do that's for your motivation. And then there's a totally separate you know, part of your day or emphasis in your curriculum on knowledge building, and then a totally separate part of your day and emphasis in your curriculum on fluency development. And again, I can't find research that would really lead us to think this is the way uh, to go to address these sort of one at a time and in isolation. In contrast, um, I, uh, working with my uh, co-authors, um, we've developed a a layered model of effective comprehension instruction. And this graphic is in the article that you'll be receiving. So what we argue is that we really situate different aspects of reading comprehension instruction one into the next. So we do know that just generally effective classroom instruction, so classroom instruction um, that's not, you know, specific to literacy, but things that you would also hope to see in math and you would also hope to see in social studies and science and so forth, that, that those features can have an impact on reading achievement. And I've just given some examples here in the margin. Um, and then we also know that a context that motivates literacy engagement and, and some of the practices that have the most research support, um, goal setting, um, giving choice, uh, focusing on student interest, that that is sort of embedded within an effective general classroom instructional model. And then within that language, um, as I'm sure everybody listening to this webinar would agree, um, mediates or permeates 
um, you know, all the, the enactments of, um, of relationships and of instruction within a classroom. And of course, there are different kinds of language that we work hard um, to develop with students. Um, academic language is probably um, what you're most often uh, finding yourself thinking about, but there's also things like disciplinary language, understanding how we use language, sorry about that, in the context of say, um, our science instruction versus how um, we use language. Okay, I'm back, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so we also think about disciplinary language development, how we learn to use, say, the discourse that you might expect in a chemistry classroom, for example, compared to the discourse that we might use in historical analysis. And then within that language development, you see that we've talked about knowledge building or activation. And um, that's you know, the science, the social studies, and the cultural knowledge building um, and activation that's really important. And this is one of the ways that we really think about connecting to children's cultures and to their um, home and community experiences. And then situated within that, we have engagement with text, uh, where we're engaging with text, particularly written texts, where we're talking about tax, where we're uh, researching with texts and so on. And then within engaging with tax, there will be some period of time where we're teaching about tax. We're teaching text structures, text genres, text features. And finally, that we're teaching about comprehending. That is that we're teaching the kinds of thinking processes or strategies that readers use to support um, their comprehension, particularly when they're stuck. So we... Uh, I'm going to stop here. This strategies and other using gradual release of responsibility. There is a, a, a table or a chart in the, the Nell Duke reading that's in Blackboard that some of you will read that outlines this. It's such a great chart. Um, you should probably, if, even if you're not reading that one for your uh, live action role play, pull, just open up that PDF and take a look at that chart. It's really kind of good visual helper as for teachers. Um, to kind of like how you can plan out your scaffolding and gradual release of responsibility for how you would teach strategies and, the, and kind of these processes. So we'll definitely open up and look at that. Are arguing that this layered model really better represents what we see in research. In research tested approaches to developing comprehension, you're often will see several of these layers represented within a single intervention or instructional model. So one feature that I want to make sure you're aware of in this model is um, the opportunities for differentiation. So if we have a student whose um, primary challenge um, or a challenge for them uh, really seems to be around motivating comprehension, then we might pull the ribbon out, uh, you know, extend it for this student because they need extra support in the area of motivating literacy. If we have another child where what's needed is maybe some additional instruction on specific text features that may be unfamiliar, then we're going to pull that teaching about text ribbon out um, to meet the needs of that student. So this is really intended to be a differentiated model. And I hope that you really love those ribbons coming up because it took me so long to figure out how to do that. And I know it doesn't look really professional, but I thought it was pretty good for a professor anyway. Moving on, um, so differentiation um, that underlines the idea that you can pull the different ribbons of our layered model out and in as needed um, is an area uh, that has um, substantial research support, as I'll show you in a minute. And there are different ways uh, to differentiate instruction. Um, often what I recommend is, is differentiating based on students' profiles of strengths and need. Uh, so thinking about where, where does this student have a relative thing, a strength with respect to comprehension and where do they have a relative need. And um, you know, because comprehension is so complex, you will often have these um, multifaceted and um, diverse uh, profiles of strength and need. So one thing, and I talk about when I teach 346, I talk about content area reading inventories and you actually develop one um, based off of your content is the beginning of the school year. This is what you want for all your students. You want to develop kind of a profile on their strengths and needs. And that's kind of help you inform how you're going to differentiate each lesson and kind of and each class will be a lot different because you'll have different students with different strengths and needs. And so this will help really kind of plan how you go about thinking about differentiation. Um, and there's some kind of um, heuristics with how you can differentiate instruction. Um, so you're not like 
you don't have to go super myop, myopic or microscopic with each particular student, but there are ways to differentiate that can help certain students that have this strengths or uh, these needs um, and ways. So definitely think about this. You'll probably, if you have methods, when you get into methods, you'll have a lot of I've talked about how to do this, but definitely pay attention to this. You can group um, students so that they're all together because they have common uh, strengths or needs. You can also group them so that they have complementary strengths or needs, right? Your, your reading, reading group of us. Grouping students is one of the kind of the base heuristics and kind of how you can differentiate instruction. So you plan how you're going to group students very carefully and you think about that. It's just not, all right, get into groups here. There are reasons why you kind of do kind of randomized grouping because that creates a heterogeneous group, which means it'll be a mixed ability, which typically kind of, if you do kind of randomize, the mathematics behind that will get the mixed ability, but you can do grouping like this with um, students and have common strengths or common needs and you focus on specific issues with that. And then you can do kind of, um, peer mentoring um, grouping with kind of more heter heterogeneous grouping. So those are kind of the two broad ways of thinking about grouping students. Six students, for example, might have three students who have a strength in one area and a weakness in the other, and three who have the inverse profile. So they're actually working together, for example, um, engaged in dyad reading or other research tested instructional practices. Um, so the idea is you're identifying these instructional targets and then you're grouping students and regrouping students on an ongoing basis around those instructional targets. You can also group students by interest. Um, there's certainly a history of that in the field, for example, in the core, your concept oriented reading instruction approach, um, children are grouped by or students are grouped. I have a video in this module um, with um, the professors at Maryland that came up with the Cori concept oriented and it's really focused on in getting students around motivating and engaging students. So if you have time, it's a supplemental video, it's not required. I highly um, suggest watching it because it's um, he's really good. And yeah, I'll just stop that. Oh, start by interest um, in what are called idea circles. So um, that's certainly another way to group can also group students um, by allowing them to have choice, uh, for example, about what they want to get their reading instruction applied to next, you know, what, what book series or what topic of books, or by the reading goals that they have set. For me, um, my read of the research and, and my read of, um, of, of what makes uh, the best sense uh, for students in terms of their development, I don't recommend uh, grouping just by, by level. Um, and I, I don't rec Yes, I completely agree. Do not do grouping based off of reading level. Um, it's really problematic and you'll get, um, you'll get, um, I can't remember the effect called, but basically it's the Matthew effect maybe um, where the strong readers will get stronger and the gap between the stronger readers and the students that are struggling gets wider and wider. If you do by level, do not do this. It's really not a great way to do reading instruction. You can do targeted reading instruction with students that are a certain specific level, but you're not going to always. You're not going to do it all the time, and it's not. Yeah, don't do that. Recommend uh, grouping by ability. Um, I think that the grouping model I shared in the previous slide is uh, superior to that approach. Um, and then I want to emphasize that your grouping needs to be flexible, right? So you're moving students in and out of groups as their strengths and their needs and their interests and their choices uh, shift, all informed by a formative assessment. Um, and I, I do have a, a new formative assessment tool available on my website, nlkduke.org. Um, it's called the Listening to Reading, Watching While Writing Protocol. Um, it's free. Uh, there's lots of videos and support materials um, that was developed in collaboration with Alessandra Ward and Rachel Klingerhofer. If that's something that you're interested in, um, please check it out. One thing you can pay attention to in the Atlas videos, um, the case studies, is think about how they're grouping um, the students um, with reading instruction. And it's kind of interesting. Um, you'll start noticing patterns. Um, with kind of how they get flexible. And you'll, the teachers will write up why they're um, grouping students in a certain way. And that's important because in EdTPA, when you write up your lesson plans, you have to kind of uh, write up kind of using research and theory to kind of back up why you're grouping students the way you're doing. 
So definitely read those commentaries from the Atlas videos because that's going to really help you with your Atlas. And it, and a lot of the Atlas is kind of, you're going to be talking about how you're differentiating the lesson. Oh, but anyway, we use that formative assessment information that we get from and not necessarily our tool, any number of tools. And we use that to group flexibly so that students are moving in and out of groups around different instructional targets over time as they need it. I also spent a lot of time figuring out how to make those little people move. So hopefully you saw that and were impressed. Okay, um, if you're interested in reading more research in the area of differentiation and literacy instruction, I highly recommend a review that came out in 2020. Um, it's referenced on your screen and um, it'll be a, a really good source for thinking more about the research on differentiation of literacy instruction. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn to nine key findings from research on reading comprehension that we share in the uh, article. So the first um, uh, insight or understanding that we share is that teaching foundational reading and bridging skills supports reading comprehension development. Um, so foundational reading skills, uh, that's uh, phonemic awareness, concepts of print, uh, word reading, those are uh, absolutely uh, critical, uh, decoding phonics instruction. These are uh, things that, that there's really no question in research are necessary for uh, effective reading comprehension. Uh, if kids cannot read the words, there's not gonna be much chance of making a ton of progress in reading comprehension. So um, an absolutely necessary condition a not sufficient condition, I'll get to that in a little bit, but absolutely necessary. So it's always striking to me when people are pitting word re reading instruction or phonics instruction specifically against comprehension because you need both of those things. You, you can't have one uh, without the other long-term in a reading space. Um, and indeed, research does find um, that at least some of the time uh, when the only intervention students receive is an intervention around word reading, that alone can have a positive impact on reading comprehension. Now, um, this view that you see on your screen is, um, it's called, we're calling it the active view of reading. Um, and there's a reference down in the bottom corner. Um, this is from a piece that will be out in reading research um, quarterly. And the active view of reading has a, 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 a number of features. And I certainly, that's like a whole nother talk. I don't have time to get into all of them, but I wanna really draw your attention to the middle of the screen. So you see that we have this oval for word recognition and we have this oval for language comprehension. And you've probably all been exposed to um, models uh, such as the simple view of reading or the rope model where word recognition and language comprehension are depicted separately from one another. But what we find uh, in research now going back a couple decades or more is that there's actually shared variance or overlap between word recognition and language comprehension processes. That is, there are certain um, constructs that are both associated with word recognition and associated with language comprehension. They sort of bridge those two constructs to support reading comprehension development. And there are lots of references and so forth um, in, in the article that's coming out. But, um, notice here, uh, these bridging processes include print concepts, reading fluency, vocabulary, morphological awareness, and something called graphophonological semantic cognitive flexibility. So um, you will notice that our first insight didn't just say teaching foundational word reading skills supports reading comprehension development. We also said teaching foundational word reading um, and bridging skills supports reading comprehension development. Um, so three bridging skills that we talk about in the paper are morphological awareness, that's the first one. And morphological awareness is a very clear case. When you have stronger morphological awareness, it does support your word reading. Um, you are able to recognize specific morphemes um, and that aids you in decoding. Um, but it also helps you on the Especially if you're teaching sciences, um, the morphemes of science. So watch something else. Huh? You really need to watch something else. I'm in a meeting. Sorry, I got interrupted by an eight-year-old. Um, back to morphemes. So this is really um, 
teaching students with kind of morphological awareness and doing kind of activities like vocabulary activities around morphemes is is really kind of good especially in the sciences but any of the technical fields like math science history you have different types of words with different roots and get them to kind of think about those morphemes within each discipline is kind of um, something you want to think about the language comprehension side um, because we can use our morphological awareness to help ascertain the meaning of unfamiliar words um, so morphemes the the largest meaningful uh, uh, unit in a word. So if you take a, a word like um, returnable, <laughs> there are multiple uh, morphemes in that word and that helps you um, figure out the meaning of the word. So morphological awareness instruction has been um, shown, oops, sorry, to improve reading comprehension. And there's a really clear illustration of that within our article. Um, in the article that we feature in our article, the, the piece in the third grade reading test, um, it says the woodchuck watches the enemy coming closer and closer, then poof, the chuck, da, da, da. So if you have morphological awareness, you can imagine that it might be a little easier for you to recognize that the chuck here refers to the wood chuck from the previous sentence. So it's just another way um, of illustrating the importance of morphological awareness as a bridging skill for both word reading and language comprehension, then contributing to reading comprehension development. Another bridging skill that we feature in the article is fluency. Um, and you probably know, um, anyone listening to this webinar, that, that fluency is, is bridging in, in many senses, but an important one is that fluency both reflects comprehension, that is, if you're understanding what you're reading, you will read it more fluently because you will reflect your understanding in, in the cadences and the intonation and the prosody or the expression with which you read, but it also affects comprehension, that when we are more fluent, we read more accurately with greater automaticity and greater prosody, that helps us to understand what we're reading. So it's another example of one of these bridging processes. And finally, there's a bridging process that we um, talk about in the article called graphophonological semantic cognitive flexibility, which I apologize is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, but um, this is really just um, the brain's ability to simultaneously attend to uh, letter sound relationships or more technically graphing phoneme relationships and to attend to semantics or meaning. Um, and some brains do that better than others. Um, but uh, the ability to do it is associated uh, with reading comprehension uh, success. It's really one of a larger um, category of skills that are known as executive function or EF skills that we know are very associated with reading comprehension. So if you take a look at this figure on your screen, um, I'd like you to think about what could go in this question mark here. Just take a moment and think. So my guess is you saw this row as, as representing desserts and this row probably being modes of transportation, this column being words with B, this column being words with the letter P or with the sound specifically. Um, and so something like plane or pontoon boat uh, would work in that question mark uh, area. So what research um, by Kelly Cartwright and uh, others has found um, is that if you uh, train or provide instruction to support um, children's graphophonological semantic cognitive flexibility, that does in fact improve reading and comprehension. All right, so a second of the nine key insights that we share in the article um, is that reading comprehension is not automatic even when fluency is strong. This is a very important understanding. It's possible that every single person listening to this webinar already knows this, but I have to say it's a really hard sell and a really tough message um, in the broader field. Um, lots of educators, um, politicians, family members, lots of people just don't seem to be able to quite wrap their heads around this. So um, the idea is basically that um, of, of, as I've established, being able to read words well is a necessary condition of high quality reading comprehension, but um, it's not a sufficient condition. So what we do see are some students who, or readers who are able to read the words uh, well, uh, have age appropriate uh, word reading skills, but are still um, not comprehending well. 
Um, Spencer and Wagner did a, a really lovely meta-analysis in 2018 um, of this population. They found 86 studies that they analyzed 86 studies of students with this profile. So this is this is not some sort of fluke, right? This is a clear profile in the field. Um, and then Kuhn et al. had a, a really interesting study uh, released in 2020 um, in which they looked at students who um, did not pass the United States um, North Carolina third grade reading test. And about a third of the kids who didn't pass the third grade reading test were actually absolutely fine on all the measures of foundational skills, um, oral reading fluency, um, but, you know, many things that, that go into that as well um, on the Dibbles assessment, um, that they uh, did well on all of those and still didn't pass the third grade reading test, which is another way of just looking at evidence that, um, that this contention number two is true. Now, of course, there are lots of other students whose um, challenges with a state uh, or a national third or fourth grade reading test are um, partly in word reading and partly in other things. So with third understanding, um, another one that can be a bit of a hard sell in the field, um, but I think really is the most defensible conclusion to come to from actual scientific research studies, is that comprehension instruction should be, begin quite early. Um, so one place we definitely see this is in um, the area of read alouds. There are lots of um, studies that show the positive effects of read alouds um, short term and in some cases long term on um, comprehension development and um, those studies date back actually. So a lot, a lot of this research is actually it becomes caregivers are the first reading instructors because doing read alouds with young children is kind of the beginning of this and so studies have shown that students, young people that have been read to as children or have seen adult caregivers reading aloud or reading, this alone kind of helps um, explain the difference between the gap in, in reading comprehension. So it's a really important kind of um, thing, especially if you're a parent. There is at least one study I'm aware of about reading aloud to infants, but certainly in toddlerhood, preschool, and then uh, kindergarten, first, second grade, and on. Um, and then another sort of area, I'm just giving you a sampling, where you want to think about comprehension instruction uh, beginning early is in the area of comprehension monitoring. So comprehension monitoring is paying attention to whether what you're reading is making sense to you. And it may not make sense to you because you misread a word, uh, and you need to go back and fix that word. It may not make sense to you because you zoned out. Um, it may be that you just don't have the content knowledge that's allowing that to happen. But for whatever reason, we know that good readers pay attention to whether what they're reading actually makes sense. Let me be very clear. I'm not saying to prompt students to identify words based on sense. That's not something I recommend. And if you're interested in reading more about that, I have a piece on the topic in um, the journal Educational Leadership, um, the November issue of last uh, year called When Readers Get Stuck. Um, so I'm not suggesting you prompt students to sense when they're trying to identify a word. What I'm talking about here is um, monitoring after you've identified a word, whether it's the right word based on whether it made sense in the context and monitoring for lots of other reasons, like to make sure that you're not sort of zoning out as you read. Anyway, so comprehension monitoring is a very important process in reading, and it's one that has a lot of individual difference. So some students, and I'm sure you've all worked with them, are just naturally very attentive um, to their comprehension, and they do notice when something doesn't make sense. They stop and they figure out what's gone wrong. But other students um, don't, uh, and research has found this, just don't um, as naturally engage in comprehension monitoring and need um, more support in that area. I want to show you why um, this really intersects with word reading development. Let's imagine that the sentence is, I can get a dog. And let's imagine that a child read, I can jet a dog. Now that would be a very logical reading error to make because typically when the letter G is followed by the letter E, um, you would pronounce the G with the G sound, not with the G sound, right? So that's a very natural, you know, reading error that you could see a child make, even if they've had good phonics instruction. So 
what we need them to do is to notice that I can jet a dog doesn't make a lot of sense, at least in most contexts, unless it's a story about putting dogs on jets or something. Um, so that they go back and they fix it. If they don't go back and fix it, they don't notice there's a problem, they don't go back and fix it, and they're not lucky enough to happen to have an adult sitting with them while they're reading, and we all know that in our class sizes in the US, um, in our context in the US at least, you're not going to have the luxury of always having an adult sitting right next to you while you read, right? Um, then what could happen is that they'll end up um, mapping, orthographically mapping G-E-T as jet, right? Because there wasn't any mechanism to correct them from making that mapping. But if they're comprehension monitoring, they'll realize JET was wrong, they'll go back and fix it, hopefully trying the other sound for, for uh, G because they would have gotten instruction in multiple sounds um, that G commonly represents, and then they're mapping GET onto GET. So um, I hope that this helps to show why we can't actually wait to attend to comprehension instruction until after kids have developed a certain threshold of reading, um, word reading skill, because it fosters the development of the word reading skill to also receive instruction and comprehension monitoring. So um, I hope this just is at least one illustration of why um, time and again studies simply have not supported this notion of a sequential um, approach where first you do nothing but word reading instruction and then later you do comprehension. It just just has not panned out in research. So the fourth um, major uh, finding that we talk about in our um, work in, in the article is um, the value of teaching text structures and features to foster reading comprehension development. And um, in narrative, uh, teaching story elements, so teaching setting, character, and, and plot, I'm going to stop here and talk about this is really important for secondary because we we become experts in kind of the content area and we need to start thinking about the text structures and the features of the text we read within each different discipline. So the text structures and features in science texts look a lot different than in narrative um, features, which would be more in an English language arts um, classroom. So pay attention to this. And I think in the 346 class, that we teach, we use Buell, and Buell has some really great kind of uh, frames and tables about how, what these are, and kind of uh, how you can ask questions or, with students and set up kind of questions around getting students to kind of think about text structures and features. So this is really important, especially in the content areas. Um, and identifying the problem and resolution. That's something that's been studied for many decades and definitely uh, has a strong, uh, robust research base behind it. Um, but teaching informational text structures has um, had not gotten as much attention in the early work, particularly with younger um, students. But now we have a considerable body of research on the effects of teaching informational um, text structures. Um, to the point where uh, in the last five years, there have been two meta-analyses on informational text structure instruction. So we can really see that there's a substantial body of work now and the results of those meta-analyses, um, and by the way, meta-analyses are big quantitative study of studies. Okay, um, the, the conclusion from both meta-analyses is that the informational text structure instruction is an effective mechanism for improving reading comprehension. And we see this conclusion quite notably um, among young elementary school students as well as uh, older students. Yes. When I say informational text structures, um, here's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Um, this is a table that's available free online at the What Works Clearinghouse um, through the United States Institute of Education Sciences, um, uh, led by this particular practice guidance led by Tim Shanahan. Um, and if you look on page 20 of the guide, you can see this table that presents five common informational text structures along with uh, various information like clue words um, and examples that go with those structures. So oh, take a deep breath. Uh, we're, we're doing well. 10 more minutes um, of, of listening to me ramble on, um, and then we will get to your questions. Um, so a fifth insight that we uh, try to share in the article is that comprehension processes vary by what and why one is reading. So you can see with this one that we're back in a little bit more of the basic research. Um, 
with clear instructional implications, but we're back in the basic research um, looking at the it's key important with getting students to answer, be able to understand the answer to why one is reading a certain book in your class. And if you can get this out of the way, you'll get more motivation done. Um, if it's an authentic reason of why one is reading, other than, oh, it's just busy work, then you're not going to get a lot of buy-in with students. So this is a big, important question you want to ask as teachers as you're setting up your lesson plans around reading a certain text. The nature of comprehension processes. Um, Kate Roberts and I did a review um, in 2010 of um, different studies of how people process narrative versus informational text. And we found 18 distinct differences um, that have been identified in research studies between the processing um, activities that people engage in for story or narrative reading versus informational text. So that's some indication that comprehension processes do vary based on what we're reading. Um, more recently, uh, we have neuroimaging to help us think about this question. Um, so on your screen is a citation to a neuroimaging study that looked at the nature of so this is why teaching, getting students and doing kind of lessons on genre is really important is because students' comprehensions will, if they understand what the genre is, and genre is kind of like text structure, but also the social purpose of a text, they're going to be more likely to understand and comprehend what they're reading if they kind of have a good understanding of what the genre is. And that's why doing genre analysis in all the disciplines is really important because this really does help comprehension especially with texts that they're unfamiliar with, but if they can recognize what genre it is, they're gonna help, they'll, they'll understand it a lot more effectively. Brain activity, depending on the text genre being read and um, was able you to show uh, that there were differences in brain activity. So we can be really confident that comprehension processes are not this like one unitary thing, um, but rather that comprehension does vary, like what our brain is doing when we comprehend varies depending on what we're reading. And it also varies depending on why we're reading. And uh, research has shown that both in um, online uh, contexts and also in print-based contexts. So in both um, places, your purpose for reading actually affects the activities, the mental activities in which you engage. So, um, the um, finding here has, uh, and, and a number of other uh, research findings have led me to uh, want to coin a new term. I worry that the term of comprehension uh, sometimes um, elicits or suggests a fairly passive activity that's very unitary. Um, in, and as I've already said, that, that really doesn't appear to be the case. So I'm trying to coin this term compreaction, um, which is a combination of comprehension and action. And the idea is that compreaction is the act of doing something with the meaning that's been constructed. So if we're reading to learn about something that we become interested in, or we're reading to be entertained by the antics of a funny character, or we're following the steps in a procedure or a how-to text, or we're reading in order to critique an argument um, that someone is making on a political topic of interest to us, or we're reading to understand an issue in our communities, um, I'm trying to call it comprehension, the doing with. Um, of comprehension. And um, I think that this concept um, may be supportive to us on uh, a number of levels, but one is it would help us understand, um, I think, uh, reading comprehension interventions and approaches, uh, some of which I'll share shortly, that actually um, have students not only, for example, getting instruction and in comprehension strategies or building their knowledge, but doing something with that information. Um, some of my own work has uh, been in, in project-based learning, and uh, that's one arena where you can see comprehension compre in action. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna move to a sixth point. Um, and this is a point about vocabulary and knowledge building. Um, and I've linked those two. We do know from research that vocabulary knowledge and, and general world knowledge are not isomorphic. They, they have some overlap for sure, but there's also some um, distinct, um, distinct uh, pieces of each construct. So um, we know from research uh, that vocabulary instruction improves reading comprehension of texts that feature the words that have been taught. 
what research has mostly not found, and I'm drawing here on research um, by uh, Gina Cervetti and by Tanya Wright, um, a, a review that, that they published in Reading Research Quarterly, it doesn't yet look like teaching vocabulary has a broad impact on reading comprehension achievement, but it certainly has an impact um, for texts that feature words that have been taught. Um, so one thing you want to think about is not only building vocabulary on text, so you preview a text and figure out what words your, your students are going to need to know to understand the text, but you also want to do activities that get them curious about um, words or kind of word consciousness so that when students come across an unknown word, they just don't skip past it and forget about it. They actually kind of maybe think about it, stop and go and try to figure out what that word means. I think that's what Nell's going to start alluding to is what you want to think about. And then in terms of knowledge building, this is, uh, let me set this up. This is an example, many of you maybe have seen it before. Um, and I know we have some international colleagues for whom uh, this uh, example may not work. Some, some, some colleagues from outside the US, but if you'll just indulge me for a minute, go ahead and try to comprehend this passage. This is a classic example, as I said, it's, um, you may have seen it before. Um, and generally what happens is that if you are familiar with the game of cricket, um, then you understand this passage. And if you are not familiar with the game of cricket, you have no idea what that passage uh, means. And this is an illustration of the importance of content knowledge to reading. Um, and so, that illustration, I hope, um, is one way of supporting the broader point that uh, building students' knowledge is a way that we can foster reading comprehension development. Now, it's surprising how little instructional research, you know, where students are randomly assigned to, to different approaches, for example, um, has examined the impact of knowledge building on reading comprehension. Um, but there has been some research um, to, to show uh, the benefits of knowledge rich uh, comprehension instruction, um, and it's certainly a growing area of interest, including in a recent uh, meta-analysis cited on your screen. Um, so, uh, so this is an area, again, um, that should be part of our total layered model of um, developing reading comprehension. So conclusion seven, or finding seven, um, in, that we uh, work to convey in our article is that comprehension strategy instruction improves reading comprehension. And this one is so interesting because hardly could one identify an area of research in which the results have been as consistent and as long-standing. That's why you see a lot of like anchor texts on kind of comprehension strategies in a lot of classrooms, like predicting, visualizing, summarizing, questioning, uh, paraphrasing, is because there is so much research that comes back saying, yes, teaching comprehension strategies will most will be the one of the most effective ways to kind of teach reading comprehension. And that's why you as you as a content teacher are going to be a reading teacher because you're going to talk about comprehension strategies within your discipline. As we see in comprehension strategy instruction research, I mean, so many studies show efficacy of comprehension strategy instruction, and yet it's sort of fallen out of favor in a lot of contexts. Um, just lots more in the article, but um, just to kind of map it, Sometimes the comprehension strategy instruction is fairly narrow. Um, we focused in sort of short term, and we see that that improves comprehension. Um, two uh, relatively recent uh, reviews of this research. Uh, one is on self-questioning instruction, and the other is on inference instruction, and both show positive effects on reading comprehension. Sometimes um, in studies, the comprehension strategy instruction is actually long-term and it doesn't involve just one particular strategy, but clusters of strategies. And that also has been shown in review after review to improve reading comprehension. One thing you want to think about, especially early on in the school year, is to get students to have kind of meta conversations around different strategies they're using to tackle the text that they're reading and have and kind of like get, get students to have conversations around how they are, uh, what strategies they're using to come across when they're reading complex text. It's really good to have kind of like little um, like Socratic seminar-ish type of thing involved in getting students not to talk about the, the text per se of the, of the reading, but how they, the strategies they used. And they can kind of teach each other how they each read 
differently, they use different strategies, but they might learn some new strategies that might help be more beneficial. Um, so definitely think of how you can design lesson activities around metacog, con, it's called metacog conversations. And you actually, it's, it's almost like, um, or you have a, a, a reading discussion, but the reading discussion isn't necessarily particular on the reading, it's a discussion around what strategies everyone use. And I do an activity like this when I do teach face-to-face -to -face 246, but um, it's a little bit more difficult to do in online asynchronous, but I do, um, if you, if you if you were to take my class in the fall, we would actually do this, and I think it's on uh, a gaming a gaming article um, that's actually a graduate level kind of gaming article that's really very difficult for most students to kind of grapple with. So a lot of the the students or the pre service teachers taking the class have to rely on what strategies they're doing to make make sense of the text, um, and so. Definitely, uh, I would highly suggest it. It's, it's not only a great activity, but it's I think it's enjoyable for students to have conversations of what, how they're um, how they're figuring out or um, what kind of ways they're doing to make sense of a really difficult text. And you want to really make it's the only time I do a cold reading where I don't do activate background knowledge or do any front loading is around this because I want to get students to think about what strategies. Um, they're doing to kind of tackle a reading that's kind of a cold reading on their own. Apprehension. Right. So this is really um, a, a, an area of strong research support. Now I want to return to this false choice I presented earlier. This is not a choice between knowledge building and strategy instruction. Um, most or many effective strategy instructional approaches are embedded in a knowledge building context. In fact, so science and social studies um, are a common site for strategy yes. instruction research. So this is not a false, uh, this is not a dichotomy. In fact, most um, of the science one or the other. This is research is of social studies and science classes. Um, I also want to say that there is some really bad strategy instruction out there and also some really bad or poor curricularization of strategy instruction where you know someone tries to translate um, the strategy instruction into um, an instructional uh, model. So so to be uh, or into a, a curriculum materials and, and doesn't do so very well. So to be clear, um, not all strategy instruction is good. Well implemented strategy instruction is good. That's similar to lots of other areas like phonics. Not all phonics instruction is good. Well implemented phonics instruction is good. Um, so now if we return to our layered model, just notice that we have that knowledge building um, and activation here. And then we've embedded teaching about comprehending here. So really trying to um, show uh, this, this layered approach rather than an either or approach. And again, allowing for these ribbons to be pulled in and out depending on the learner, the context and so forth. So our eighth, um, conclusion that we wanted to uh, share in the article um, is that supporting engagement with text fosters comprehension development. <laughs> and this seems so obvious, uh, maybe it goes without saying, but um, you know, if students are going to get good at reading comprehension, it would be really good if they engaged in reading comprehension. <laughs> um, and so uh, there are lots of ways that that happens. Um, so volume reading, um, studies that have looked at uh, interventions designed to get students reading more outside of school uh, tend to show positive effects, although they need to be done in certain ways. Um, lots of positive effects of certain kinds of text discussion and analysis. And writing as well, that engaging with uh, text. Yes, I'm a writing teacher and this is really important. So writing and reading go hand to hand. So you want to think about how, not only how you're setting up reading instruction in your class, but also how that moves into production and the written production it synergizes well with reading. And um, to be a good writer, you actually have to be a good reader of the genre that you're writing. So they are definitely kind of linked. So that's why, um, that's why we call it literate. They're not longer the International Liter uh, Reading Association, they're a National Literacy Association because reading and writing are so connected. Through writing about and along with text um, is another uh, strong area. Um, any of the areas I've talked about so far today can be subject to inequity, where some students are getting um, better and high quality instruction and some students are getting less 
high quality um, instruction and that that isn't randomly distributed across the population, but that it often is anti-black racism or racism of other kinds that is systematically um, denying some kids as many opportunities as other kids um, to engage in uh, with text or with any uh, high quality or effective um, instructional approach. Uh, socioeconomic status is another area uh, where we see differences in the reading comprehension development opportunities offered to students. Um, and although, again, that's applicable to anything I've talked about today, I really wanted to, to draw attention to it in um, this idea number eight, because we do know that things like opportunities to engage in higher order discussion in classrooms um, are not uh, actually evenly distributed across the population. And that's clearly an area where we have work to do. So here, uh, if you can just one more time with me, I'll look at this uh, layered model. Um, you can see that we've put lines above and below engagement with text to really just try to emphasize like that's an absolutely central component of an effective reading comprehension um, instructional approach. And finally, uh, number nine, uh, instructional practices that kindle reading motivation improve comprehension. Um, that is improving reading motivation improves comprehension. Um, we know that this is a causal relationship. That is, you can cause reading comprehension to be higher if you make certain moves to improve reading motivation. Um, I tweeted, um, well, uh, let me back up and say, um, sometimes people think of motivation as a property of an individual, like, oh, she's very motivated or she's you know. very important. The social context and making reading a social act is really correlated with kind of motivating, especially reluctant readers. You need to really kind of embed this in kind of a broader kind of the big D discourse of kind of a social context. It's not an individual private property thing. It needs to be kind of things where we look at reading socially. And you, you do this well, because think of all the social reasons why you read and write to hang out with your friends. You're motivated to do that, right? No, he's not very motivated. Um, but that's not really how motivation works. Um, research suggests that motivation uh, lies very heavily in the social context. So we can make people more or less motivated by a particular context and particular activities. So I had tweeted uh, and Facebook post did this uh, piece. Um, a while back, um, a delicious meta-analysis, I said, on the impact of motivational reading interventions. Um, so you can check this out in my Twitter Facebook feed, um, or you can look it up directly. It's McBreen and Savage, McBreen and Savage. And it's a really nice um, meta-analysis of the impact of motivational reading interventions. And I was accused of using the cupcake as clickbait, which I guess I was, but I'll do anything to get people excited about a meta-analysis. So to summarize, um, instructional research, I've argued, has a very important role to play in the science of reading. So knowing um, what particular instructional practices have been proven to be effective in scientific research studies in which children were randomly assigned or students were randomly assigned to one instructional approach or another, um, I, see, I believe have a place in the science of reading. There are many well-supported understandings about the nature of reading comprehension as well as comprehension instruction. I've talked about nine of those today. And we've tried to capture uh, many of those understandings and avoid some of the false choices and mischaracterizations that we see in the field by presenting a layered model of reading comprehension instruction. I'm gonna stop sharing now and um, attempt to answer any questions that you um, might have put in the Q&A or the chat. And I think it's not too late. So if you have a question that's arising uh, in your mind right now, please feel free to share it. Now, thank you so much. We could listen to you all afternoon. On behalf of ILA, we just want to thank you for your presentation. It was timely and informative. And I just want you to know there is so much love and appreciation for you and your PowerPoint with the ribbons in the chat box <laughs> uh, and just so many wonderful things. Um, and so much learning going on. So I also want to thank the entire ILA community for participating in the chat. For uh, Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We will try to get to as many as possible. And I will start out, we have a question from Kathleen and it states, my district is moving to a structured literacy reading program for all K-3 students. How can we build upon this amazing research 
when limited to the total full text. So limited time um, to do read alouds, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so the first thing I should say is that unfortunately structured literacy is another term that is, you know, already sort of meandering in terms of what, uh, you know, different pieces, uh, different people interpret it and also, uh, you know, programs claiming to be it who maybe aren't and programs aren't claiming to be it who are and so forth. So, um, you know, as always, we, we really want to interrogate and kind of get beyond just, just the label that we might um, have. Um, but it sounds like one feature of the particular form of structured literacy um, that your district is uh, looking at is that um, it uses decodable texts. And so I would say the following. Um, the first is that um, we still want students monitoring comprehension, even with decodable text. And if the texts are so nonsensical that you couldn't know if you were reading it correctly or not, you know, if your comprehension monitor. So I don't know if you've had any experience with reading basal readers, but some of them just the the words are easy, but the story structure and just it makes no sense. I when I was teaching in Korea, we had a series of readers, and I just thought these were the most ridiculous things. So they just were they are nonsensical. What's going on here? What what is this buzz? You know, and you're using words like buzz and it's just strange words. It's it's really kind of it makes me irate when I see the stuff like that. You can't kick in. That means it's time to find other uh, decodable texts. There certainly are good decodable texts out there in the field. Uh, we look for decodable texts that um, have attention to decodability, but also have attention to other research supported um, characteristics of effective texts for early readers, um, such as word repetition, such as word concreteness, um, and such as, uh, you know, making sense, basically, you know, natural uh, and, and comprehensible um, language. And you can learn more about that from, um, among other places, the website textproject.org. Um, so making sure that those decodable texts are of sufficient quality, um, that students can be monitoring their comprehension, um, and that they can be rewarded for the hard work of, of reading um, by the engagingness of the texts. Um, so if that's in place, then we can still teach our comprehension monitoring and um, some of our other uh, basic comprehension processes within the decodable text. And then we'll clearly want uh, to complement those decodable texts with read alouds of high quality literature in which we engage, uh, literature and informational text in which we engage in meaning making. We'll want to make sure that we're using texts in our science and in our social studies um, that also provide uh, rich opportunities uh, for comprehension, comprehension development. Um, so it's really a matter of making sure um, that we are providing those texts that really help and support word reading development, uh, which decodable texts um, certainly can do, but that we're um, not limiting ourselves um, to just those texts uh, within the context of a school day, and that we're making sure uh, that we're using high quality decodable texts. So we have another question from Michelle. And what, if any, would be the place for translanguaging within your um, layered model of comprehension? Where would that fit in? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, I mean, translanguaging is really in that language development uh, strand that I think is like third from the top. Really, you know, language mediates or permeates the whole instructional environment. So, um, so certainly translanguaging um, has an important place in the model. Um, and I think that one thing we really want to make sure that we're thinking about when we're thinking about translanguaging is that, you know, when we are engaging with children around, or students, um, usually children for me, because I work with the younger ones, but mm -hmm. anyway, when we're engaging with students or children around comprehension, that there are many, many ways to construct and express our meaning. And so we want to make sure that students can engage in uh, conversation and uh, dialogue with themselves and with others using lots of, of modes. And so that may be verbal, but when I say language there, I'm also thinking about visual ways that we can respond to and share our understandings of text and so on. So um, definitely a prominent place in the module and I put that or in the model and I put that in that language development ribbon. We have another question from Joanne. What is your view of school districts implementing a, I'm going to put this in air quotes, right, science of reading approach that focuses mainly on explicit phonics instruction and initially 
um, using that explicit phonics instruction uh, for students who were diagnosed with um, dyslexia. But then they adopt it as the district reading curriculum. Oh. Good question. So um, one of the things that I think the field really needs to do um, right now, uh, as soon as possible, is um, to try to move our thinking into a full day of instruction. So a typical, at least in the US, and I know this does differ, and we have some colleagues from other countries where this maybe is not quite the same, but at least in the US, you know, a typical school day is going to be six, seven hours long. Mm -hmm. So I don't think anyone wants us teaching phonics seven hours a day. So clearly other things are going to happen during that school day, right? And so um, where there may be a part of the day that's really intensively focused on developing students' word reading ability, um, hopefully no one's arguing that's the whole day. So what else is in place? And my concern, among others, is that when we think of science of reading, we need to be careful to not think that that only means how we teach students to read words. We know that research addresses, scientific research addresses many other aspects of literacy development and many other liter aspects of literacy development can be challenging for students. We also know, and I've tried to at least imply this in the presentation, that there's reciprocity. It, mm -hmm. It's these things actually, one informs the other, these bridging processes that I've talked about, for example. Um, there's a beautiful blog post that uh, Tim Shanahan put up about re reciprocity that I think is, is definitely worth reading. Uh, Mark Seidenberg has also been writing and talking about reciprocity too. And I think um, he's got a lot of, of wise things to say about it. It's the actual science of reading, like the actual studies that are in journals that people read, that researchers read and do, um, those suggest um, a much more complex and, uh, and reciprocal um, set of relationships among different reading processes than I think is ending up getting translated into um, a lot of districts uh, or in some, unfortunately, uh, education thought leaders, you know, into some of their ideas about what constitutes the science of reading. So I think the way I would have that conversation is, all right, let's look at our seven hour day. How much of that day are we gonna spend on phonics instruction, and now how are we gonna use the rest of that day? And how are we gonna design that day so that we really can support as many learners as possible um, who may have any number of things that, that are challenged. Remember I shared that finding a third of the kids who are not passing the third grade reading test in North Carolina, the issue is not at all word reading, right? So we wanna design a day that's gonna work for all those kids um, and one sort of, last point is that as you're thinking about those seven hours and how to allocate those time, that time, uh, differentiation, again, really needs to be considered. So if we think, for example, of, of the wonderful late Carol Connor and colleagues research, she really showed that if you differentiate instruction, so some kids are getting more word reading instruction and some kids are getting more meaning construction instruction based on their needs, Classrooms that, that do that do better <laughs> than classrooms um, that take, a, you know, everybody get the exact same thing at the exact same time all day approach. Oh, we are just about out of time. Thank you again for joining us tonight, listening in and sharing your questions and comments. A big thank you to our interpreter who is doing a fan. All right, so I'm going to stop the screen sharing now. Does anyone have any questions that I could clarify um, from what she presented? Everyone ready to go to a grad school in uh, literacy? Yeah, no, everyone's quiet. All right, uh, take care, be well. I'll do another live session with Ernest Morell in two, I think, two weeks, maybe. I'm losing track of time already. Um, that one is live, um, so I won't be able to stop and make commentary, um, but Ernest Morell is um, quite an engaging speaker, so I'm really excited for, for that presentation, and that's on critical literacy, so um, kind of my, my area of interest. All right, be well, take care. I'm going to stop recording now.